Today's episode is very, very special to me. Um, I've got the woman who changed my life. That's how I'll introduce her to you guys on on the show today. Her name is Catherine Dixon. Um, Catherine came into my life uh, during the lowest low of my life and it had a radical impact on my life. And I still work with her every single month to this day. So I don't know how long it's been, maybe six years or something like that. Um, And we are gonna talk about Clarity Coaching Institute. Um, Her process, Clarity Coaching, which pulls a lot from the work of Byron Katie, if you're familiar with that. Catherine knows Byron Katie very well and found her back in the 90s and, you know, has been on a whole journey with that. But she's been doing this work for over 20 years, her own thing, um, Clarity Coaching. And yeah, I mean, I can't say enough about it. Um, It's definitely something that I talk about a lot on social media to all my friends, if I, if you're in my life, I've probably recommended you go work with Catherine because she's just so life changing. Like she's such a gift to the world. And, um, yeah, we're going to dive into a little bit quick backstory on her, um, how she came to this work. Sometimes I wish she would go a little deeper with the details, but that's all right. <laughs> she's such an amazing woman. And then we're going to go into kind of understanding what it is. And then I'm going to actually do a little mini version of one of her sessions live with you guys. And I was pretty vulnerable and real. It was, I did one on the fear that I had around writing uh, my book that I'm writing right now about my story and transforming and basically how I came from hell to heaven (laughs) in my life, you know, um, at least internally, but also externally, literally live in paradise now, you know what I'm saying? But I live in paradise inside myself now. And a huge part of that is because of Catherine and her work and she'll say no it was because of you but you know (laughs) all right so let's go ahead and dive into this very very special episode here is Catherine Dixon all right you guys um I'm inviting you guys to a very special conversation today between me and Catherine um Catherine is I don't know besides my kids you know maybe up there for like the most important person to me on this planet you know um Ooh, maybe going to cry a little bit. Me Just too. so, so grateful, you know, like she knows, she knows where I was at when I met her, you know, I'm, um, met Catherine through Drew Manning. Thank you, Drew. Um, when I was in the bottom, the most deepest bottom of my life, so confused, <laughs> angry, you know, feeling so right and justified in all my confusion, as you taught me, you know, <laughs> to put that word on it. <laughs> confused. I'm like, what do you mean by confused? This is how it is. <laughs> so um, anyway, I Catherine's been on the show before, but it, it was so early in my podcast endeavor. I really wanted to um, bring some of her to you guys. And you've probably, if you've followed me for any amount of time, you've heard me refer to Catherine many times as the woman who changed my life. And so thank you, Catherine, for coming and sharing. It's absolutely an honor, Tara. I'm really delighted to be here. Mm. I'm, yeah, I am. Thank you. Mm. All right. So I asked Catherine, I asked you if um, you would mind sharing a little bit of your journey. Um, It's the coolest journey I've ever heard of, but I'm going to leave it to her on how many details she's willing to share with you guys. But I'll like, I'll just add before you get into it, like Catherine is a seeker, a deep <laughs> spiritual seeker. Like she is my home girl that is just a few years ahead of me, but also more, a little bit more brave and courageous and adventurous mm-hmm. than me. Probably, you know, <laughs> you have been on a huge seeking journey and it has landed you in what you've been doing the last, what, 20 years? Is it 20 uh-huh. years? 21. 21 years as doing your clarity coaching. So could you share a little bit of yeah. your journey? Yeah. yeah. Um, my childhood was kind of one train wreck after another. <laughs> Start with that, which makes someone scratch their heads and say, what's going on here? And I was raised um, Catholic. And so I threw myself heart and soul into that religion thinking okay, the closer to God I'll be, the less I'm going to hurt, right? Mm-hmm. And um, it didn't really pan out that that way for me. Um, you know, I was very devoted and then things happened and I just, yeah, it clearly wasn't the way for me. Um, and then, let's see, 
yeah, I was just very, very distraught. I, you know, couldn't, what's the word? I, I couldn't integrate all of the craziness in the world. I knew mm -hmm. that we were here to love. I knew that was why I was here, but I didn't understand why it was so hard to live from that or even to see much authentic expression or mirrors of that, you know, and I certainly, you know, didn't know how to deliver any clean, clear love back then. But at any rate, you know, so I tried this, that, and the other. I went to a bazillion different churches thinking maybe I just had the wrong one, but <laughs> I found out that churches weren't my thing. Um, and then I moved to California when I was 17, when I just decided, okay, just get away from everything, you know, and I became a wild kind of hippie girl, to put it all really succinctly. <laughs> and, um, and you know, it was a beautiful time. It was the first time I kind of felt like I got my own traction in my life. And um, I was also, we talked about this a minute ago, um, I was, a, I, someone gave me a hit of acid. I was actually really thinking I couldn't, this was actually before I moved to California. I was thinking, I can't handle this at any rate. Someone gave me a hit of acid and I was like, oh, I can. This is, <laughs> there's something happening here. I mean, I felt like I'd come home to myself. Mm. I didn't even know that was possible. So I went through a phase where I ate a lot of acid, you know, <laughs> and um, it was, it was kind of my, my spiritual thing. This was back in the seventies before everybody was doing a, well, in California, everybody was doing a lot of it anyway. But at any rate, I did it and it was just really healing and gave me an equilibrium and all kinds of things we won't get into. But um, at a certain juncture, it just stopped working. And I was like devastated because that was kind of my soul journey thing. And I was doing it pretty much by myself. A lot of people weren't involved, but I felt like my reason for being was snatched from me. And I was really quite distraught. And then I heard, you got to get there yourself. <laughs> I was like, right, like that's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, anyway, long story short, I actually wound up joining a spiritual community, which I was in for 13 years. It was a disciple of Yogananda's um, and we lived on the land. There's still people doing it, but I think we had like 300, 400, 500 of us at peak, you know, and then, wow. yeah. And we, you know, it was, it was idyllic. I mean, my first yeah. three years there was heaven because all I needed to do was run around on the earth and, you know, meditate and, you know, work in the fields or help in the stores. We had some health food stores. At any rate, it was very, very sweet. And then as <laughs> I guess it, at any rate, uh, yeah. So I was there for 13 years and then I left and we had moved to Salt Lake City. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. And it just came to me that it was time for me to step out of that. And I was kind of frightened I was married. I had a daughter. My daughter, Jessica, is still with me. She has Down syndrome. She's my master teacher in this life, truly, truly. And, um, you know, so we moved to Salt Lake City and here I still am, much to my surprise. Mm. I have been a seeker inspired mostly by agonizing suffering a good part of the time, to be really honest with you. And um, it wasn't until, well, I was here it was in 1997 that I went to an event where Byron Katie who no one had heard about was presenting at the yoga center in holiday and um I sat and I watched this woman who just looked like anybody off the street sitting with this young man who was incredibly beautiful in every way he was probably 17 18 and he was gay and this was back in the day where you know, that wasn't quite what it is today. And he was also Mormon. And so it was a real challenge. And his heart was just rent into two because he loved his family, but he also was who he was. And he didn't know how to find any kind of peace. And in 45 minutes, his honest answers to these simple questions that came out of Byron Katie moved him from agony to ecstasy right in front of my face. I mean, I was like, Wow. Wow. 
wow. And then, you know, she worked with a few more people and she lived in Barstow, California back in that time. And so I went there as often as I could and just threw myself into this simple process because it blew my mind how powerful it is slash we are. I mean, the questions are just questions, but they tap into the wisdom that lives inside of each one of us. However, we've been raised in a culture where the answers and the, you know, experts are out there somewhere. Mm-hmm. And um, consequently, it never occurs to us to look inside of ourselves. And that's what's so innovative about this, because we've got our answers. You know, Tony Robbins has answers for Tony Robbins. And are they helpful for other people? Yes, they are. But your answers are even better for you because they come from source. Oh, my goodness. You okay? (laughs) Yeah, sorry, guys. I've gotten two chest colds since I moved to Hawaii. Mm. just lungs oh so it's getting me right now sorry yeah not a problem so I threw myself heart and soul into self-inquiry with the work of Byron Katie Mm. and never looked back this is kind of a good segue into these questions right you mentioned that she just asked some questions yes Mm -hmm. which is what you do Yeah. yeah yeah so how do you take somebody from agony to ecstasy. Well, and I, I want to kind of clarify there. I don't take people from agony to ecstasy. I don't have the power to do that. People take themselves or they don't. What I notice is it's such a simple process. They do quite readily. Um, so the questions simply are this. And I, yeah, the question is, so you look at a place where your life isn't working. You want me to go this place and explain? Yeah, it? yeah. So it. Any arena of your life that is not what you want it to be for any reason. Maybe it's scary. Maybe it's limited. Maybe it's frustrating. Maybe it's painful. Maybe it's whatever. So you look at a particular moment in time where you are not happy with what's going on in your experience. You write out these questions, these your answers to these questions about that moment. So that's kind of laying the foundation for your belief system in that moment. I'm frustrated at my mom because she never listens to me or what have you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, Can I interject real quick? Mm-hmm. Yes. But I'm going to tee up what she's going deeper into right now with like what it feels like to me is a very skilled ninja (laughs) helping me, guiding me deep, deep down into my subconscious (laughs) mind in places that I normally wouldn't go because it's uncomfortable. So for example, like if I mildly feel frustrated with my kids about something and it just kind of keeps, sometimes I'm good, sometimes it comes up and every time you know, it comes up good enough. I get frustrated and I get into all these kind of like, it's, you know, resistance and like, this is so frustrating and it's them and it's not me and they, and blah. And like, um, and then, you know, those of us who are people pleasers kind of go into this, like, okay, well, I just need to be more patient with it. I just need to, you know, work on this. And, and it, this is the kind of stuff that you have done for me is like those kind of things. It's like, you are literally just guiding me so skillfully into like what all is underneath that. And, you know, it's appropriate. Byron Katie calls it the work, you know, with you. It's like, sometimes I say, like, sometimes I tell people close to me, like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to really talk after a Catherine session, because (laughs) I feel like I just got a lobotomy and I'm like seeing everything differently. And I need to kind of like, let it settle, you know, Uh, I can't really talk about it right after. It's like, I'm just like, it's like a subconscious, like, and I'm like, Whoa, I just see things differently now. So it's really powerful. So I just wanted to tee up that this combo with that. Exactly, exactly. And we don't even need to, because we talked about going through the process. So let's do that at a certain okay. point. But what I want to say is the reason this is so effective is because we think we see reality, right? I think yep. I know. I live in Utah. Da, 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 you know, um, I see my beliefs about Utah. I don't see Utah. Nobody's yeah. in Utah. You know, I don't live in the same house as my daughter. You know, we live in the context of our belief systems and they are limited. And that's why acid was so much fun for me because I was like, whoa, all right, you know, little elbow room. But, you know, 
we have the capacity to see far deeper than our reactive mind, which is typically very fearful. And so yeah. it keeps you all kind of crunched up in a little ball without you even knowing about it. One of the metaphors I like to say is when you believe any stressful thought, whether it's that light shouldn't have turned red or my brother shouldn't have died, whatever it is, you know, um, it's like kinking a garden hose, okay? Garden hoses are not very romantic images of who we are, but the fact is when you kink something, it stops working. And a stressful thought is like kinking a garden hose. So suddenly when I'm believing a little stressful thought or a big one, it alters my perceptual reality and my receptive reality. I can't see clearly because I'm caught up in the negativity or the reactivity. I can't hear what's really going on because I'm busy believing I know what's going on. I definitely can't communicate. Have you ever noticed how when you're all wound up, your communication skills take a major dive? Totally. Because we're not home. You know, the flow isn't happening through us. And this work unkinks the hose. It's an invitation, you know. How do I react when I believe my stressful thoughts? So we look at that. That's one of the questions. And who would I be without it? So how do I react is a portrait of your fearful mind. And most of our lives, I, I can tell you the reason I was in so much pain, I lived in terror my whole life. You know, not my whole life, but a good part of it. Mm -hmm. And um, it wasn't until I heard Katie say, can you know that it's true? I was like, I'll be damned. No, I can't, you know? Mm. And all of a sudden everything opened. And then, so you, you get to review the effect of holding the stressful thought, which is basically a little sojourn through hell. Yeah. <laughs> it's familiar. So we think it's kind of comfortable because it's familiar, but it's never creative. It's never developmental. It's never helpful. It's destructive mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. we're not in touch with our true nature. And then, so who would I be without this thought is the fourth question. And that is where you start opening up your mind. And really, I mean, this, this work, you can't just go through it intellectually. You, you want to take some time. It's a walking eyes open or a closed, whatever you prefer meditation. You take your mm -hmm. time. Who would I be without that stressful thought? And all of a sudden you notice your body changes, your experience of the other person or yourself shifts dramatically. Mm -hmm. Because you're not looking through the scales of your confusion and your fearful mind. So mm -hmm. this is always available to everyone all the time. That's one of the things I love about it. The answers you're looking for are inside of you. And this is something you can do yourself. You know, I've mm -hmm. been coaching people for a long time. However, you know, I like to work with people intensively for a while in the beginning so we can do some of the heavy lifting together. But they're learning how to do it themselves. And it's a simple practice. You can take it with you into the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Where, and I do. And everyone I know does. And it's such a, it's a, such a tool. I mean, I, <clears throat> I have seen countless people, like pretty much if I love you, I've sent you to Catherine. So <laughs> it's like all my friends, um, every guy I've dated <laughs> pretty much, um, you know, uh, most of my clients at some point, I'm like, dude, yeah. go deep dive. You know, when I see that confusion, it's all locked in there and it's, it has never failed two things. One, it has never failed that I saw a dramatic shift in that person after they started working with you deeper on these things in terms of they're kinder to themselves they don't get all up in everybody else's stuff. They were, they're more respectful of other people's paths and journeys, mm -hmm. um, or, you know, more accepting of how life is in general, what's things that are happening in the world. They're in this very like kind of stoic, healthy place. They have better boundaries. They show up for themselves more. They, um, are kinder, just more, their nervous systems are way more regulated. They get in healthier relationships. I mean, it, the list goes on, you know, and, um, it's been amazing to see also how they, you, they use thing tools that they've learned from you. Like, well, that's, that's outside of my realm of power. You know, they, they use some of these strategies that they've learned and I do too. And I'm really grateful to you for, um, 
you know, seeing the value and what Byron Katie was doing back in 1997, going on a huge journey with her um, and continuing to gift these tools to people um, you've trained, you've mentored many people in your, in your uh, ways. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it's, it is life-changing, you know, it is, it's like, you know, there's a few, th- I'm writing a book right now, guys, and about my life journey, which really, I probably should do a session with you to kind of finalize this because I really resisted it for a long time. Cause I thought it was vain and narcissistic. And I'm like, no, it doesn't matter. I'm just a coach. I don't need to be like, I changed my life book number 5 billion, 400, you know, <laughs> and, uh, I resisted it for that reason. I kept getting it, kept getting it, kept getting it. And I feel now I'm in a place where I feel that I've, I've been gifted with a lot of very common traumas, um, that I see now through the work that I do with people. I'm like, these are very common things. Very lo- I got a lot of them. You know, we both had some pretty interesting childhood experiences. And um, I'm, I've also been gifted with tools to, to overcome them and be in a true place of alignment and peace and love and gratitude. And I'm living in a different reality now. And you, you, my beautiful soul sister are part of what I call guaranteed trifecta of personal transformation. (laughs) You know, like I just know, and I'm not going to spoil the other aspects. You got to read my book, but I just, there's certain tools that it's like that, that they're guaranteed going to have a transformation if they do that one and that one, you know, and you were part of that. So thank you. you Yes, absolutely. And, you know, all honor and glory goes to Byron Katie, as far as I'm concerned. I mean, she, those questions and her, you know, offering of them changed mm-hmm. my life. And I do self-inquiry a little bit differently now than she mm-hmm. does. And yet it's still essentially the same. You know, mm-hmm. I do major deep dives with folks and, you know, my sessions take a while, but at any rate, yes. And it is my heart's greatest joy. It really mm-hmm. is. There's nothing I'd rather be doing than self-inquiry with people mm-hmm. because every time it's like seeing the rebirth of mm-hmm. a soul. And it mm-hmm. could be the same soul. And we just keep opening to more and more of the truth of who we are, which is ultimately, sorry to sound woo here, but it's infinite. Mm-hmm. You know, there is no end to our capacity to love, to create, to celebrate, to serve, to, yeah, to be, to be everything you want to be. And just when you think you've got it all together, this is Byron Katie quote, just when you think you can't, it can't get any better, it has to. <laughs> <laughs> You know, and it's true. And, you know, we even welcome the challenges in this work because those will bring you, you know, the constraining beliefs that you haven't dealt with yet. Mm -hmm. Right. And each one of them will open you up to an even brighter, more dynamic, sacred universe life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm Yeah. Yeah. Hey, real quick. Other favorite Byron Katie quotes. Uh, You are the teacher you've been looking for. Or she would also say, you are the lover that you've been looking for. Love it. Um, And this one I've always thought was hers, but I've seen it attributed lately to other people. But suffering is optional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Our pain is inevitable. Suffering is optional. Is that the. She would never say the first part. She would just. Okay. I just heard, always heard, suffering is optional. I've got that on my license plate, which Mm. is good for the way I drive. It's helpful. <laughs> People are like, whoa, what's up with that chick? Anyway. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So um yeah. Should we uh should we show them a little yes. bit? Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm gonna um, put myself on the vulnerability yeah. podium here for a second. And we're gonna show mm-hmm. you guys a little bit of like a very Typically my sessions with Catherine are two hours just to give you guys like a reference point. So the whole first hour is that part where she talks about you get to paint a portrait of all the results you get in your life from this one stressful thought. And then she reads it back to you. And it's every time you read that back to me, Catherine, it's like, man, that's accurate, you know? And then the whole second hour is who would I be without the thought essentially, but in a much more deep dive way with lots of questions from you. Yeah. The second part is a portrait of your true self. Yeah. And it, it, the energetic, just to kind of back up what you're saying, it's like all of a sudden my voice sounds different, which also you have, you know, that's why <laughs> Catherine is so helpful because you'll point out certain things. Like, do you hear, 
Like mm-hmm. at first I'm like kind of like small and like, eh, and then I'm like, oh, well, yeah, because blah, 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 blah. You know, <laughs> my body feels free and open. You've also taught me a lot about being able to understand where I feel certain emotions in my body. Cause that's part of your process, which has been another very helpful tool for me, because now I know that if I feel in certain areas, I'm like, oh, that's guilt. Oh, that's shame. Oh, I'm feeling shame about this. Oh, cause I can feel that. I know where that is in my body where that tends to appear, you know, so appreciate that also. And that's unique to each person too. That's why we ask so that you can kind of start tuning in to how things happen when you're believing your stressful thoughts and how you are without them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The best part. Yeah. Yeah, It's it's so amazing, but okay. Okay. So I, you are going to use kind of, yeah, we're not going to go through the whole, um, self-inquiry survey or judge your neighbor worksheet. We're just going to go to a one-liner. Can you think of, now with this work, you always want to have a very specific moment in mind because that kind of gives um, stability to the psyche to really focus. If you use something general like, you know, political parties or blah, 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 it's not going to be that great. So yeah you know i'm gonna shift gears on you i told you i was gonna do a different one but let's do the book thing let's get real okay Okay. Okay. i got a moment um the moment was i was getting these real strong intuitions about writing this book okay like Mm -hmm. over and over and over and all this kind of synchronistic stuff coming in you know when you it's just like real obvious and i still had this resistance that like um you know my stressful thought would be something along the lines of writing a book is all about me. You know, I was like, you know, it felt kind of like, like I wanted to be like, dun, 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 look at me. I changed my life. And I don't like that energy, you know? So the moment was, um, how this was a while ago. This might've been like 2020, 20, 2020, probably. Yeah. Uh, maybe 2021. I was at a mastermind and this, I was getting all these intuitions, synchronistic thing is like, share your story, share your story, share your story, share your story. It's going to help a lot of people. It's going to help a lot of people. And I was like, nope, because that is all about me and blah, blah, blah. And I'm trying to look like I'm special and blah, blah, blah. You know, I had all this stuff. And I went to this mastermind and I, I, I mean, I kid you not, it was like comical. It felt like I was in some sort of alternate reality movie or something because I just individually in so many, many conversations I'm having, and these are like mindset extraordinaires and business, you know, amazing, wonderful, beautiful souls too. And they just kept individually saying like, well, you know, the most important thing is your story. And then they'd like pause and kind of look at me, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, ah, why does this keep happening? But I, I still, obviously for at least, at least two, probably three years stuck with this story of, uh, writing a book is all about me. Right. That was my, so that's why I just, I was like, eh. okay. Yeah. All right. So it's all about me. Can you get a little specific? About um, yeah, story? let's do yeah. writing. My book is. Um, like self aggrandizing. That's the word I was just hearing. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Yay. Okay. All right. And we're doing, uh, inquiry light here folks, but it'll yeah. still juicy trust me (laughs) so yeah so yeah do you want to do 2020 that moment or does it you know are you is it dancing around your head now at all as you're wrapping things up the the moment what do you mean no the writing my book is self-aggrandizing oh yeah am i good with that as my statement okay so let's just go in the general (laughs) way okay (laughs) writing your book Tara. We're gonna let Catherine take the reins here because this is her. Uh, this is her. This is her thing. Okay, Tara. Writing your book is self-aggrandizing. Is it true? Um, and just communicating with listeners, like I'm taking myself into that moment specifically where I'm at this mastermind and people are telling me, "Oh, you should you know, telling your story is everything." So in that moment, yes, it feels very true. It's yeah. just this, look at me. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And then the second question is kind of a repeat. Can you absolutely know that it's true that writing your book is self-aggrandizing? 
And there's no right answer to these questions. There's just your truth in this moment focused on that time. Can you absolutely know that writing your book is self-aggrandizing? When I take myself to that, I can still see this one guy's fate. I'm like, I'm in the room. Um, okay. When I take myself to that moment and you ask me, can I absolutely know it's true? I can get to this place of like, maybe not, but like it is though, right? Okay, That's so we'll you. stick with, yeah, it's true. <laughs> yeah. You don't want to kind of push yourself further than yeah. true. there's no right answer. Yeah, so yes, it's true. And yeah, it is. Look at that guy's face. So how do you feel? How did you feel in that room with those people when clearly you know that writing your book is self-aggrandizing? What emotions did you feel? Mm, fear. Mm -hmm. Almost disgust, right? At the, at, the, at the thought of like being, you know, being this big, like, da, 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 look at me. Yeah, disgust. <laughs> um, I felt like, uh, I don't know, it's, I, I know it's not an emotion word, but it, there's something along the lines of like suppression or um, avoidance, you know, it's just like, don't want to think about it. Um, so maybe somewhat numb, you know, like, eh, nope, not going there. Somewhat numb or just numb? <laughs> she always calls me on these. I always say kinda. <laughs> I, that's okay. a way that we kind we kind of hide <laughs> from what's really yeah. going on. Mm -hmm. The ego, you know, we have these yeah. unconscious mechanisms that totally. keep us a little safer than <laughs> it's so true. But it's not safe. It's stuck, right? Right, right. Um, okay. Numb. Any, uh, any other emotions that you notice? Writing your book is self-aggrandizing. Fear, mm -hmm. disgust, numb. I mean, the overriding one is fear. Because it was this feeling of like, I kind of know I'm being called to that. Mm -hmm. But because I have this story, like, it's kind of like no, like, I don't want to No, like fear, like running from it, you know? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So next question, how do you feel in your body when you believe this thought? How did you in that room writing your book is self-aggrandizing? What do you notice happening in your body? Sensations we're looking for. Because the body talks to us when we're doing our thing. Yeah. It feels like my heart kind of like comes in like you know with draws itself inside a little more like shrinks in my heart mm -hmm. shrinks in um almost like every cell in my body kind of shrinks in it's the smallness it's this you know fear withdrawing self-protection maybe but that's what I'm experiencing is like a total body like energetic drawing in um Let's see. What else did I feel? Let me, let me get there. Writing your book is self-aggrandizing, Tara. I feel um, something in my throat and in my jaw. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just a, yeah. a weakness, a weakness. Mm -hmm. And too much energy in my brain. As my brain is like, feels very, it went, all went up into my mind. <laughs> it's mm -hmm. like, there's a lot of activity going on in my head. Okay. So writing your book, is self-aggrandizing and people are telling you your story matters and you're getting inner guidance to do it. How do you see your inner guidance when writing your book is self-aggrandizing? Love it. Well, apparently I see it as wrong. <laughs> it's only the, the guiding force of my entire life, but it's <laughs> wrong on this one. I see it as scary, mm -hmm. threatening, even like, oh, no, not that one. Um, how do I see it? Yeah. Writing it's like, mm -hmm. it's like pressuring me. It's, it's mm -hmm. like, <laughs> yeah, that's, it, that's how I'm seeing it in this moment. It's like, eh, don't, don't, it's like the friend that's trying to push you over to the right. water. Right. right. Yeah. And it's wrong. Yeah. Okay. So this is, I'm going to ask how you treat your inner guidance when you believe writing your book is self-aggrandizing. And I want to say something so that people can hear, because to me, this is an important element that we're unaware of for the most part, which is my perception. What I believe I'm seeing informs my behavior. So why do we do what we do? Because I'm believing what I'm believing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's as simple as it looks rainy outside. I'll grab an umbrella. 
Mm -hmm. or, you know, if I think short people are unfriendly, I'll hang out with tall people, you know, right. <laughs> and it right. all happens unconsciously, but yeah. what I'm believing I see informs my behavior. So when you yeah. believe writing your book is self-aggrandizing and your inner guidance seems wrong and scary and threatening, pressuring, how are you actually treating your inner guidance from that angle when you're believing that thought? I mean, I'm, I mean, okay, let me just roll out, like definitely ignoring it, judging mm -hmm. it, uh, doubting it, criticizing it, uh, abandoning it. Did I say judging? Yeah, I said that yep, one. Um, disregarding, mm -hmm. ignoring, avoiding, fearing. Yeah. I think that's it. That's good. Yeah. This is how we treat our inner guidance when we believe our stressful thoughts. Mm -hmm. Now, you would never do this consciously. This all plays out unconsciously because of our limited beliefs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So writing your book is self-aggrandizing, Tara. That's for sure. So when you believe that thought, how do you see your book? Uh, I see it as like, like bragging or like showing off, like, look what I did. I made my life better. <laughs> mm -hmm. I see it as cliche. That was coming up a lot, right? Uh, uh -huh. like, oh, cool. Another person who wants to talk about how awesome they are. You know, it won't be that way, by the way, guys, I have done some work around this and I'm pretty deep in the <laughs> process and I have clarity, but I'm not, not ever going to take miss up an opportunity to do some work with Catherine to get even more clear. So thank you for coming along the ride. And absolutely. And you wouldn't be doing this right now in front of all your people <laughs> if you weren't in a different place. Well, I'm pretty brave. And, I'm and pretty we're brave. also, we're also clearing out the cobwebs. So we get exactly but you can never be too clear and exactly. enjoy the clarity that you have. Yeah. And just know there's more waiting around the next yucky mm -hmm. feeling. <laughs> mm -hmm. okay. yeah. yeah. And this was a big one for me. So I'm, I'm happy to share it with anybody who wants to listen because like you get to see a little bit of like how, if, if any of this is sounding kind of ridiculous or relatable, like both of those things are nice to see when somebody's it's, it's like, it's relatable, but also kind of ridiculous when you're looking at it from the outside. It's like, you know, so I want you guys to see that because it's like these silly things, but look what they do, you know? Yeah. All Absolutely. right. So, yeah. So your book, um, bragging, showing off. Yeah. Um, and like okay. unsuccessful, you know, mm -hmm. I see it as just this like random little book that I wrote and published myself that people are like, okay, big whoop, you know? So I see it as unsuccessful and unhelpful um in this story right what i'm in this moment you know this whole well and when you thing. believe it's writing it is self-aggrandizing does it yeah unhealthy yeah. or maybe even more yeah self-promoting or like uh um yeah vain narcissistic you yeah. know like just this like uh, i don't know okay that's enough <laughs> <laughs> So when you believe this thought that your book, writing it, is self-aggrandizing, and consequently you perceive the book itself as just bragging, showing off, um, cliche, random little book, big whoop, really, not so helpful, self-promoting, vain, et cetera. How are you treating your book when you see it that way? definitely undervaluing it, um, mm -hmm. insulting it, degrading it, almost want to say abusing it, mm -hmm. <laughs> disregarding it, judging it, dismissing, writing it off. Yeah. And that's what I did for a long I hear time. Losing faith in it. Yeah. 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 Losing inspiration and faith, right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not that tear at ease. You're losing one. <laughs> completely, I don't even know if this is a word, but completely deprioritizing it, like doesn't matter, like demoting it to the bottom of like any sort of professional interest that I have. Like, yeah. Okay. And what's true about you, Tara, when writing your book is self-aggrandizing? Um. So in this story. Yourself in that room with those people, I, it's inner guidance. Mm, the story in your head as well that writing your book is self-aggrandizing i mean definitely like i'm not important right not important not nothing new 
<laughs> um, let's see. Yeah, I mean, that was definitely a predominant thing is like, I'm just one of many people who have changed their lives. So like, why do I need to write about it? You know, like, so just, you know, I kept, I would even say like a transformation story, 5 billion, 400, you know, <laughs> let's say, we'll say transformation story, 2,458, you know, <laughs> so just run of the mill. Even though like, I know that's not true. I know I've experienced, I feel like I've been on the magical carpet ride of like transformation and gifts and the like universe has rolled out this red carpet of tools for me and I can't even believe it. Like, but in this story, I'm just transformation story, whatever, you know, like it's, yeah. So that's the one I know I'm king, do you know, but it took me a while on this one. Yeah. I see myself as like, yeah, just not important, small. Uh, this kind of thing kept coming up. Like I, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about them. It's about the people I'm helping. Like, I don't need to go into all that. I can just use the lessons that I've learned through this whole thing and just help people. Like, I don't need to tell the whole freaking story, you know? So writing your book is self-aggrandizing. And when you believe that thought, you see yourself as not important, nothing new. Transformation story number 2,458, you know? just one of many people who've changed their lives. How are you treating yourself? Um, minimizing, um, criticizing, abandoning, uh, what's the word when you make somebody kind of small, like degrading? That's good. Say that. Yeah. Um, lying, you know, I'm, I, I know that's not true. I'm lying to myself. You know, I know that <laughs> I know what I've experienced and have so much gratitude for it. But in this thing, I'm just lying. This, um, scaring. Yep. <laughs> scaring myself, uh, badgering, mm -hmm. um, I've got one. Would you like to hear? Yeah. It? Yeah. Because when I work with people, I find my own version of this same story, right? Mm -hmm. So I'm constantly um, healing myself too. And I hear shaming. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Writing a book is self grandizing. When you believe that thought, how does the future look? No book. Um, it looks, I believe the thought, yeah, I just, I mean, it definitely looks like I'm not going to write it. Um, and how does that look to you? Um, incomplete. <laughs> yeah. Like I played small, like I didn't do something that I knew I was being heavily guided at the same kind of level that like really big things in my life have been guided at I that I like it looks like I abandoned one of those you know so it feels it looks um disappointing or like regretful or but it's like weird because it's like I don't know it feels like the same energy my guides have it's like it's like it's okay but also like yeah it sucks <laughs> yeah Sucky. Yeah. We'll just put, you know, like disappointing, I'll say. Disappointing. Okay. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. So my last question in hell, I like to call this phase hell. When is the first time you had a thought that doing something you were inspired to do was self, as a child, you might not have had self-aggrandizing, but, you know, mm. the self-centered self you know, too much, something like that. Can you find an early experience mm -hmm. of something yeah. that really mattered to you, but you shouldn't do it because it's you after all. Mm. So we're looking for the early experience. Okay. I, I, I think I found it for sure. Okay. It's <laughs> interesting too. Um, I remember um, bearing testimony as a little kid in Mormon church. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I, I think I just was saying like, 
Like I was in this kind of like, I know this is true and this is true. And I think I said something along the lines of like, and my friends don't know, but I do, you know, I said it like that kind of right. And when I sat down, um, oh, my mom said something like, and she said it so sweetly, but it cut to the point that I remember it, you know, like she said something like, like, oh, Tara, sweetie, like it's a little, um, bad man. She, I think she said bad manners or something. It's, kind of, it's a little bit of bad manners to, to brag that, you know, something more than other people do. And like, give me this sweet little, like compassionate pat, but I like felt so stupid, you know, I was like, oh no. Okay. So I think it was like me kind of like, you know, publicly yeah. sharing my experience. And then it was like, oh, hey, like, uh, people don't like that. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. And so what did that mean about you? I am what? I felt in that moment, I felt very like braggy, vain, uh, you know, self-promoting, self-aggrandizing because of the way I had said that. Okay. I am, uh, yeah. You want one word? I'm looking for that because okay. these thoughts, you know, they're never like, they seem like they happen in the moment, but they're all repeats of things from way back when confusion yeah. started yeah. as a child where we thought everything was about us. Most of it mm -hmm. wasn't, you know, I think I am full of myself is mm -hmm. what resonates. That's what I felt like. I'm like, Oh gosh, like, Wow. Yeah. That was really kind of cocky of me. You know, <laughs> like, yeah. I'm like eight, nine, 10, you know? All right. All right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to read this back to you. This is the effect of believing this thought, Tara, that writing your book is self-aggrandizing. You feel fear and disgust, numb, suppression, avoidance, and you just don't want to think about it when you believe this thought. In your body, your heart shrinks in. Every cell in your body shrinks in, you said. Your total body energetic draw, draws in, and you feel it in your throat, your jaw. There's a weakness, and there's too much energy in your brain. When you believe that writing your book is self-aggrandizing, you see your inner guidance as wrong and scary. It's threatening even, pressuring you. It, so you ignore it. You judge it, doubt it, criticize it. You abandon your inner guidance. You disregard, avoid, and fear your inner guidance. And in this line of thought that writing your book is self-aggrandizing, you see your book is just bragging, showing off. Look what I did. I made my life better. It's just cliche. You also see it as unsuccessful, just a random little book, big whoop unhelpful, self-promoting, vain, narcissistic. And in that, you definitely undervalue your book. You're insulting about it, degrading and abusing it. You disregard it and dismiss it. You completely deprioritize your book um, and you demote it to the bottom of any professional interest that you have. You see yourself and when writing your book is self-aggrandizing, you're not important. You're nothing new. You're just one of many people who've changed their lives. Transformation story, 2,458. Truth about you, Tara, when you're believing this thought is you're small. This isn't about you. It's about them. And in that, you criticize yourself, minimize yourself. You abandon yourself. You degrade. You're actually lying to yourself, scaring yourself, badgering yourself, and shaming yourself. And in this story, the future looks like no book. You are not going to write it. It looks incomplete. You played small. You didn't do something you were heavily guided to do. So the future looks disappointing and regretful. And your early experience was bearing testimony in the Mormon church at the ripe old age of eight or nine. And you said, and my friends don't know, but I do. And um, your mom offered a little guidance and it left you believing that you Tara Garrison are full of yourself. So that's everything you get. That's just a part actually of everything you get when you believe thoughts like this. Mm -hmm. So can you see a reason to drop this thought Tara? Yep. Yeah. Can you see any reason to keep this thought or to ever think this thought again? that writing your book is self-aggrandizing, that feels good, 
or brings you peace. That's the qualifier there. No, no. That's definitely not a healthy energy to be in, as we've just seen. Yeah. So who would you have been at that mind, mastermind? People instruct, you know, encouraging you. You've mm -hmm. got the inner guidance going. And mm -hmm. it doesn't even cross your mind, Tara, that writing your book is self-aggrandizing. Immediately. Um, I'm, I'm amongst some of the greatest mindset teachers, you know, business leaders, probably everybody in there practically has published books, you know, and so immediately who would I have been? I would have been really curious and really open and asking a lot of questions. Like if somebody tells me directly, Hey, and then I would have said, you know, actually I'm really feeling compelled on a soul level to do that. Any recommendations, you know, yeah. <laughs> so I would have been more curious asking for help, um, engaged, um, and actually way more happy and lit up. If I didn't have this code, I, I could have just, I'm trying to write your talk from Pate. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. But, um, uh, any recommendations actually mm -hmm. keep going. It was good stuff. Okay. Um, happier, happier mm -hmm. because yeah. I would have, um, like, I, I know how I get, I get really excited when, uh -huh. you know, and it would have been like, Oh my gosh, like that's, thank you so much for saying that. Like, that's exactly what's coming through for me hard right now. So I would have just been happier, more, you know, energized, mm -hmm. excited, um, just high frequency, grateful, you know, for that moment, like, Oh yay, Like, wow. Perfect. You know, <laughs> Okay. And how does your body feel without mm -hmm. the story that writing your book is just self-aggrandizing? How's your body feel in that space? With that, I, Yeah. Imagining that guy that was saying that and he said it like, so mm -hmm. oh, powerfully, like he kind of paused and was looking me right in the eyes. Right. I feel myself le like leaning in and like, you know, definitely more expansive, but like my energy is like leaning in towards his like, yes, you know, um, my body feels, uh, energized mm -hmm. and I can feel my whole body, not just my head. It's like from my soles of my feet to the top of my head, I feel, um, energized. How about your heart? My heart feels um expansive and like excited and um like that spiritual like oh like how i get when a spiritual moment happens that i'm really excited about like it's that expansive feeling yeah yeah how about your throat and jaw well i'm smiling so <laughs> they're pretty <laughs> They're, they're just fine. They're <laughs> doing their job. <laughs> doing their job. Perfect. Okay. So without the belief that you writing your book, Tara, is self-aggrandizing. If that never crossed your mind and this gentleman is encouraging you and you have the inner guidance, how do you see your inner guidance? Like, uh, what popped up was, thank you. Like, thank you for this, you know, I always call it like the gingerbread crumb trail when you start to see uh, synchronicities, you know, with things that are coming through. It's like, oh, thank you. So I just see them as helpful, um, amazing, um, intelligent, loving, generous. Mm trustworthy mm. um beautiful mm -hmm. allies and so how will you treat them instead of ignoring and mm -hmm. owning Res and respect mm -hmm. yeah appreciation uh, appreciate them um, 
love, admiration, and awe, <laughs> with awe. Um, it's like, uh, what's coming up for me is like giving them like an energetic hug, you know? Mm -hmm. I hear something. Do you want to hear it? Yeah. You trust them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. More open. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it's like celebrate with them. Mm. Okay. And so without that thought, how do you see your book? Without the belief that just it's just aggrandizing, self-aggrandizing. And I mean, now in this energy, like I see it as like, <laughs> this, this is what I love about your work. Yeah. And like, like I'm really here, you know, like when I allow this to sink into my body, I'm like, now it's like, wow, this is like, obviously in that moment, like this is really important, like bumps up to like, priority number one because this all of this synchronistic you know th these things are just like coming out of everywhere it's like I see it as like a major priority you know <laughs> why what's true about what you're writing or what you're going to write? because I'm getting so many like obvious signs mm -hmm. to per to you know pursue that um okay and I'm going to ask you to like, what is your book about? What is the purpose of your book? Mm. Not the thought that it's self-aggrandizing. Yeah, it's service. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> yes, it's technically about me, but I know the energy with which I would write something. And it's, I'm, I'm vulnerably sharing as a method for teaching and, 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 and inspiring and showing so people can understand at a deeper level, um, energetically, the painful places that I've been and the confused places that I've been and always will be and some levels, but, um, <laughs> it's like, I'm seeing it as a way to more deeply share the energy of what I have experienced so that it can, um, not only inspire others that that's possible, but give them tools, right? So it's like a guidebook um, is how I've been writing it with some really juicy, relatable, painful, interesting <laughs> stories. Um, and I love to write. So I'm, if you've ever read my Instagram post, you know that because they go as many words as they'll let me, you know? <laughs> right. right. Okay. So, yeah. So see it as a, a, a like a he healing tool, you yeah. know, uh, um, a resource for like some treasure that I have found that has really helped me that I can pass along, you know? Yeah. Like really helped me, like taking me from like, I was the worst people pleaser that I've met, you know, I was in victim mode mania in my body and my life and my relationships, you know, and like, I've been so gifted to meet you, you know, plant medicines, meditation, you know, I won't give away all the things, but there have been some powerful tools that have dropped in my arena. And it, you know, that's why I do social media is like, I would do social media for free. I love to like share what has really helped me and Come what may, if that helps somebody too, cool. If not, cool. But I love to share it, you know. And yep. yeah, yeah, so. yeah. I'm hearing it's a connecting. Yeah, um, connection, yeah. right? Yeah. You know, so that people don't feel so out to lunch in their own little worlds. We share some of our train exactly. wreck, and they're like, "Oh, Tara made it through. Maybe uh, I can." Yeah. All right. All yeah. right. Um, okay, so I'm concerned about time. Are we doing time wise? We're at capacity usually, but we'll finish, you know, like usually, yeah. Okay, because, okay. So, okay. All right. So, what's true about you without the belief that writing this book is self aggrandizing? Who are you without that story? If you can't mm -hmm. even comprehend the notion of uh, what. I'm kind of like seeing visually, I get taught visually a lot, so it's hard to like put it to words, but like I'm seeing myself as like, 
one like it's it's yeah one of many but it's in a totally different energy like um I see myself as yeah as someone who has experienced a lot of common human experiences that are painful and have found it's like I found like like we're all in a tunnel maybe and I like the lights over here you're like look you know so um just a helper <laughs> um uh, a a resource someone who's found some really cool stuff mm -hmm. it's brought me a lot of joy and just sharing so I see myself as a yeah like a maybe guide for some people maybe not sure. maybe just a juicy story for others <laughs> um but yeah helping people find light you know in a dark tunnel okay I have a thought do you want to hear it yeah without the thought that writing your book is self-aggrandizing you're generous mm, thanks you know to share yeah 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 because a lot of it's kind of embarrassing you know but i'm not <laughs> I, I mean it should be embarrassing it was embarrassing I'm, I'm okay with it that's been cool to write too is see how much healing i've done because it's none of it's triggering me Wait. you know Wait. yeah so how's the future look from here without any notion that writing this book is self-aggrandizing Ooh, um, fun. fun. I've, been doing, I've been doing a lot of visualization work with this. I've seen all sorts of stuff. I've seen people coming up and talking to me. I've seen people on an airplane. I've, you know, like had, I've seen messages come in my DMs. I've seen picture, you know, I do a lot of visualization work with this now and it's fun. It's very connecting. Um, I see my future as more heart centered, you know, with this in it just it's so beautiful when you share something vulnerably mm -hmm. me cry yeah and like somebody comes and tells you that that like really made an impact on them mm -hmm. it's so heart connecting it's that is received by me with so much joy you know and love so yeah a lot of connection a lot of love okay and who would little tara garrison who just bore her testimonial <laughs> and, you know, I know things you don't, <laughs> which so is perfect. I mean, isn't that true about all of us? We all yeah. do. That. <laughs> Everyone knows things that other people don't or the perspectives at least. Yes. Yeah. So how would you have seen yourself without the thought that you were, that your offering was too much or bragging? <clears throat> honest with my own experience mm. that was my experience you know well then who's your mom to argue with it right <laughs> yeah 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 well i wish we had more time i'd go into something here but i won't okay so without the belief tara garrison that running your book is self-aggrandizing you would have noticed you're among some of the greatest mindset teachers and business leaders there are. And you just would have been really curious and open, asking lots of questions. Actually, you might have said, actually, I'm feeling really compelled on a soul level. Do you have any recommendations? You would have been happier and really excited, more energized, high frequency, grateful for that moment. And when that guy said that, you, your energy would have been leaning in toward him. Your body feels energized and you feel your whole body from the soles of your feet to the top of your head. Your heart feels expansive, excited. It's a spiritual moment and your jaw and your throat are smiling. <clears throat> your inner guidance without the thought that writing your book, self-aggrandizing. What you notice is thank you to your inner guidance for these breadcrumbs on the trail of synchronicities. They are helpful amazing, intelligent, loving, generous. And your inner guidance is trustworthy, beautiful, allies. And so you'll respect and appreciate them, love, um, treat them with admiration and awe, big uh, energetic hug for them, trusting them, more open to them and celebrating with them. And your book, he said, without this thought, you are really here with your book. And this is really important. 
It bumps up to priority number one. There are so many obvious signs. This book is service. It's technically about you, but you're vulnerably sharing as um, a method for teaching, inspiring, and just showing, way showing, yeah? So people can understand the confused places that you've been. Um, it's a way to more deeply share your the energy of what you've experienced and give tools, healing tools. It'll be a resource for some of the treasures you've found that have really helped you. It's a vehicle of connection. And you see yourself as one of the many, but in a totally different energy. You have experienced a lot of common, of common human experiences that are painful, and you can offer the lights over here. You're a helper, maybe a guide. I drop the maybe. And you're generous, you know, in wanting to share like this. The future is fun. There's a lot of visualization coming up for you, people coming up to you on airplanes. Um, it's just all very connecting and heart-centered. It's so beautiful when you share something vulnerable and someone shares how you've really made an impact for them. The future looks like a lot of connection and joy and love. And young Tara in that church, when the mom said, hey, and you just shared your experience, you would have just seen yourself as honest with your own experience. So now you have a choice. Before inquiry, we're just stuck with our limited thoughts. But once we question them and tap into who we are without them, we have a choice, a conscious choice of life with the thought or life without it. And it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, I'll take life without that one. I... <laughs> So we'll do a quickie turnaround. I'm just going to walk you through it. You take the original statement and you turn it around in a variety of ways. The first one, and this is about a thing. So um, writing my book is not self-aggrandizing. Um, yeah. Can you see how that's true? Yeah, definitely. Give me it's... some examples. Well, I mean, the entire desire behind it is just to help you know um so the energy i'm writing it with uh, is has nothing to do with that in fact i like i said a lot of it is kind of like whoa man am i really going to share this <laughs> like, yep i am no filter here we go this is uh, got ugly you know it got stuff got ugly mm -hmm. and i'm going to share it because i know that it gets ugly for other people too and when you scoot over that stuff, like then other people start feel more alone and in, in the deepest parts of their pain. Yep. Yep. And then another turnaround here is interesting, which would be not writing my book would be self-aggrandizing. Nice. Yeah. Well, I mean, in that whole story, I was <laughs> not writing it. I was making it was all about me, right? Not yep. writing about about it was all about me. I don't want to look like this or be like that or, you know, uh -huh. so, yeah, it's true. Yeah. Interesting, huh? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we question the stressful thought and we see that it's not true, we bounce the language around of the sentence a little bit to see what else might be as true or truer. And there's usually a lot more truth in it. It's deep work. Mm. So Thank there you. you have it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for anybody who came along the ride on that. And I hope that you can get a little gist. I mean, that I, I just dropped in. I thank you so much. You did that. That was good. That was a mini session, but that was powerful. And it helped me yes. see, it just helped give me so much more clarity on like what exactly was all going on in there. Right. Like I, yeah, I got past it and I've, you know, on some levels I'm like, okay, I understand I'm serving here, but that is so illuminating of like, oh, wow, that was in there and that was in there and that was in there. And I think that's what has been so beautiful. I mean, there's so many aspects, but getting that kind of clarity, getting the body stuff, getting like the the earliest memory has been so powerful for me. You know, it's like, whoa, that's that story has been in there since eight, nine years old of don't be too self-aggrandizing, you know? Yes. And yes. after your sessions, I always say like, 
seriously, I'm not joking. Like so often spontaneously after your sessions, I'll find myself singing. I can see clearly now <laughs> the rain is gone. You know, I'm like, it just pops in. I'm like, that's how I feel. Just lights, you know, just light. Like, wow. Okay. Yeah. And anybody who's watching this or listening, you can hear Tara in her true, yeah. and, you know, yeah. it's, it's it's inside of us all the time. It doesn't really ever go anywhere. You don't lose you. You just stop tapping into you when yeah. you stop believing nonsense. You know, how do I know what to question? Anything that hurts. If it hurts, it's a sign that you're believing something that's not true about yourself or someone else or whatever. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And look at us these days. We're we're kind of going to town with that sort of nonsense. Mm. But I think I think the prevalence of it is opening us up to new ways of being too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, true. Well, Catherine, thank you so much. I love thank you. you. I love you, and so I'm so glad to, to offer this. And yeah, it is it is my heart's greatest joy. Mm. These questions, so that people can see the truth of who we really are, and to practice it myself. I still practice it all the time. You know. Mm. It's not about becoming. Oh, you do more than anybody. I, I just well, real quick, I'm gonna energize. I, we, Catherine and I talk a lot. I mean, I don't. It's just constantly. Well, I, this happened, but I did a worksheet on it, and oh, I just love this work, and I found out this, and like, I mean, that is a very regular conversation with you. Well, there's <laughs> radical grace behind absolutely everything. So why would I stop? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Yep. That's why I've been working with you for like six years. Cause it's yes, like yeah. every single time I'm like, Oh, I'm doing really great. I don't think anything's really been getting to me. And oh, then I'm no. like, <laughs> okay. Let me like really. Oh. And it's always like, Whoa. right. Right. <laughs> right. More, yeah. you know? and it's, it's funny because we're, we've, you know, come become so comfort in our stuff, comfortable in our suffering. It is hard for people to really admit, you know, what they feel. Yeah. yeah. Because yeah. you know, lots of times the people we're the most frustrated with are the ones we also love the most. And so, you know, it takes a little bit of trust. That's why yeah. working with a coach initially can be helpful because you yes. start to trust yourself in the process and then you can fly off on your own and do your own thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, if people want to work with Clarity Coaching, how do they, how do you recommend they get started with that? Just go to claritycoachinginstitute.com and you say i would like to do some sessions yeah perfect easy yeah. very all simple right. all right thank you so much catherine thank you bye-bye